Hey, welcome to the second episode of season three of the First State Cop Rights podcast, a podcast for Liverpool supporters in Delaware and friends of those Liverpool fans in, in Delaware. Um, and and uh, I, I should point out that this is not associated with uh, the official supporters club uh, of, uh, of Delaware, um, even though a couple of us are, are members, um, in case anyone's listening or wants to check. Welcome today. So uh, we welcome back Hytham, uh, who's in Chicago, I think, today. Uh, and uh, Justin from uh, from New York is also joining us. He's just uh, uh, do, doing a round of podcasts because he's just completed uh, a show with the Anfield Wrap about the official supporters clubs and what they've been up to during the pandemic and beyond. Um, so thanks, thanks for joining us. And uh, it's uh, we've also got Sean and uh, me, Paul. Okay, so season starts in 13 days. We had a chance to see uh, a lot of fresh faces. Uh, it seemed like uh, on Friday, was it Friday? I can't remember. Uh, last week uh, when we we went, we lost 4-3 to Hertha Berlin. Um, I think in one of the posts I shared with, with someone, I, I think I might have said it's the best performance I've seen um, was put in losing four go goals to three because uh, I thought there were so many positives. Um, so feel free to disagree with that. Um, but we're going to do at least one one round on this. Um, what did you take away from that game? Uh, and um, you know, who, who, who particularly caught your eye? Um, what, lots of narratives around um, Virgil and obviously Joey, as I think he's now uh, called. Um, you know, but uh, take it whichever way you want. And I'll start with you, uh, Justin. So I'm just going to do this. I'm going to let myself get sucked in by Nabi Keita again. Uh, he looks fantastic. He's 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 dribbling, is you know, very 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 effective. He's running at teams. He's carrying the ball. He's doing so many of the things you need from a midfielder, and in particular, also he's just incredibly active in the pressing game. So I'm just going to allow myself again to get suckered by the the talent and be tantalized by it until we find out maybe like you know three weeks from now that he's out for like you know six weeks with. Uh, I don't know, like a, a bruise toxic or something. Like, uh, pick your pick your injury. It, 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 it. But uh, for now, I'm just gonna you know allow myself to be optimistic that maybe Magic Data can finally put it all together and stay healthy. That would be a wonderful thing. Uh, well, Sean has a theory, and he might expound on it that uh, that Nabi gets injured at international games, and that then cascades through the rest of seasons. So uh, we've got three games at least before the first international break. So, um, so maybe I'll go to, go to you, Sean. Might want to reflect on Nabi's next injury or, uh, or or anything else more positive, perhaps from the Hertha game. Well, I can't comment too much on the game because I wasn't able to watch it. Oh, um, but it I, I read a lot of the reviews, mm -hmm. um, and it it seemed like Nabi was good again. He was good in the in the, in the prior game. Um, yeah, I mean it's preseason, but uh, you know it seems like um, Mane was was looking good again, um, sort of shared some thoughts with you earlier today. It, it would be interesting if Mane snapped back to his 1920 form and it's possible he just had long COVID last year and everybody was panicking for, you know, uh, kind of exaggerating the issue. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it sounded like Kanate looked look great again. And, and it was, I mean, the biggest thing, I guess, for me is it was great to just see that Joe and, uh, Virgil were playing um, just that they they got on the pitch I think that's a good sign um, you know my expectation would still be for Matt up and Konate probably to start the first game but um, you know if, if they're both getting minutes they can't be too far away so that's a good sign yeah yeah uh, and as far as Navi I mean I, I think he actually has gotten a lot of his injuries when he's away with with Guinea and um, you know they're just uh it's a very poor country and um you know it, it, it seems like he he gets injured when he goes away with them and then like we kind of have to deal with it and then it takes us a long time to deal with it and then next time he goes away he gets injured so hopefully his time off last year has allowed him to uh to sort of you know get in a better position so that he's not picking up injuries but yeah. um I guess I'm not quite allowing myself to get totally sucked in, but it is really nice to watch him when he plays like that. Um, you, you think about what he could bring to the team. I, th so. I think both uh, Keita and Massive just for me in the game, the preseason game so far, I've just 
you know, injuries aside, it's showing you what really good footballers they are. I mean, I, I think both of them are in a, a, a higher uh, class of player than, than most people give them credit for. Um, so, yeah. Hayden, you're, uh, you're, uh, hopefully you watched uh, the game. Uh, I think you did, because I think we uh, exchanged some messages about it. I did, yeah. I, I, I actually enjoyed it. Um, typically, I don't really pay a whole lot of attention to preseason games just because, you know, I, I've seen the last time I saw them in a stadium was, uh, I think, the preseason before uh, the season when we uh, won, uh, 2019, 20, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, they came here to uh, Indiana played at Notre Dame and, and we went out there and watched them and, and we played Dortmund and we lost three to three to one, I think that match. Uh, but I thought the match was, was uh, entertaining. Um, you know, I, the score is the score and it's preseason from a player's perspective. Yes. Nabi was good. I agree with everyone else. And then obviously it was good to see, Van Dyke and, and, and Joey uh, uh, going in, that, that piece was, uh, I don't know, I had goosebumps when they were so thin. So that was good to watch. Uh, there was one moment, I think it was the fourth goal, uh, the assassin, the Liverpool assassin, uh, ex-City uh, player, uh, Co- oh, I forgot even his name. Joe Vitic. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I think uh, it was, it was, him and Van Dyke and, and Van Dyke ended up falling over before the guy scored. And I was like, oh, please don't let it be another injury. Um, so I was, I, was, I was happy that nothing happened there um, because it, it was kind of awkward. And then I understand he's just coming back and he's not in uh, game shape or whatever. But then there was a moment where it felt like he was twisting something. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys uh, paid attention to that, but that was a little scary for me just because he was just, he's just coming back from a big injury. Mm -hmm. But overall, you know, uh, I enjoyed it. You know, uh, the other piece that I really enjoyed is uh, the kid, the 16 year old uh, on the right wing. I think uh, his name is, uh, is it Gordon? I forgot his name. Heidi Gordon, I think his name. Gordon, yeah. He's he's just... uh, He's showing a lot of potential. I mean, this this was his second or third match, um, and, and for a sixteen year old, just to, uh, if nothing, have the guts, you know, to um, run and and, and try um, and all of that stuff, you know, that was that was uh, interesting to watch and, and joyful. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I must. Uh, so we'll, we'll 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 reflect maybe a little, little more on the game because I think that the it, it's been interesting for me that he's picked a pretty consistent team for that first half of the two games now. I guess the Minamino Oxley chain one was one one change. Um and and you know the team had Elliot in it. Um and I, I actually thought the second goal they scored where Keita pressed, stole the ball, Salah with the back heel. Mm-hmm. I you know felt a bit like the Shakiri goal, the overhead kick he scored against Man United. It was like, yes, we're ready, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so anyway, I'm there, gonna... there felt like something. There felt like something in that goal that was something that we hadn't seen from Ox trying in the uh, false nine position, which is like as a false nine, Ox in the few preseason games has seemed very allergic to getting into the box, yeah. and Minamino, you know, actually does and gets the goal for it. Like there's something to be said about forwards having forwards instincts and midfielders having midfielders instincts. It's a, what is Ox is a guy who's played most of his career as an outside as an outside player or like you know kind of as an attacking midfielder, not as a number nine. Like he could fall side or not, but still a center forward role. Like I, this is like that Lolana is a holding midfielder thing. It's not going to end up that way. It's just it's not what his instincts tell him. It's not what he's going to do. And you don't retrain the instincts of a guy who's twenty seven. Yeah, yeah, I, I I tend to tend to agree. Yeah. There's probably a top 10 list of things that were tried and didn't work. And certainly the the Lana as a holding midfielder was on that list somewhere. Um, The Oxley Chamberlain as a false nine may be following it down that, that, that path. So uh, any, any any other thoughts about, especially the, the sort of the first 11 they picked, especially Elliot in that midfield role. We had a, we had a few back and forths about where did Elliot play exactly for Blackburn? Uh, And I think I thought he was playing for them in midfield. 
but uh, Sean tells me not not so. Yeah, he played as he played as a he played as a uh, a right sided forward slash attacking midfielder for them. Like he, his positioning was definitely further forward and further to the right than like a crop style eight. So it's a definite position switch. But I mean, he's seventeen and it's Mali still. So yeah, I think he. I mean, I think from what I could tell. I mean, I, I didn't watch enough of him, but. It looked like they played a four-two-three-one sometimes, and he'd play on the right side of the midfield. But it's you know in a four-two-three-one, so he still he was playing that right side. But um, it is, I mean, it's, I I am really, I mean, I think he's he's young and and um, super talented. Um, I think it's it is very interesting that they're playing him in that role. Like they they must see something there. Um, so yeah, that that has been one of the interesting things in these first couple of games. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to me that we haven't tried in any of these games. We've basically gone four, three, three uh, in all of the games. Then given the kind of experimentation last year with four, two, three, one, um, that we haven't at least given that a bit of a go. Yeah. Um, okay. That was a, that, that felt like a big thud. Um, so we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> I would say that not all our players are back. So that could be part of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, not all of them are back. Um, the the, the uh, I, I did. Re I was reading today that uh, the, for whatever reason Henderson has longer uh, has, has been given a bigger break than uh, the Brazilian boys, um, which I don't know why that is, but uh, yeah, he's 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 not coming back till they come back to England, whereas the Brazilians have already joined the party in France. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that too. That Henderson's going to join the team when they when they come back. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what the, I, I don't know what the, the reason is there, but I, I saw earlier in the week that the Brazilians had joined the team. Yeah, is sure. it Avion? I don't know how to pronounce it. Was Avion. 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 Um, and uh, and that you know Henderson's just going to join them when, when they get back to England. But um, I don't know. I mean, you know, the other thing is that Henderson is still kind of coming off that injury. Um, and, and, you know, he kind of, I don't know if he was rushed back to play for England, but I, I wonder if, you know, they would have handled his recovery a little different or if he would have taken more time off if he didn't have to come back to play with the team, you know? Yeah. So that could be part of it too. It just, just seems strange that, you know, he's, he's like the club captain and because and, um, you know, the Brazilians aren't actually participating in training, even though they've, they've gone back uh, yeah. right away. So. Okay, so let's uh, let's wrap up the Herta. And so, any other reflections on the the, the game the other day, Item? Not really. I mean, just you know, um, again, it was uh, just like what we were talking about the last uh, on the last episode of the podcast. It's good to see the game playing again. Yeah. Uh, uh, or the team playing again. Um, just excited, you know, for the new season. Um, you know, uh, you know. Hopefully, uh, Justin talked about it. Navi continues to be continues to be healthy. Um, but you know, uh, just looking forward to the next couple of games. I don't, I don't know when the next one is. Is it? Um, I know they're playing Sunday, but is there a match before that? They've got these weird Thursday, like two sixty minute sessions. Okay, with Bologna. Um, hmm. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. Um, Maybe maybe that's just so that they can get some of the Brazilians on the field. Right. Um, I don't. I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I I think with the Brazilians, basically the only one who you might see be completely ready to play ninety minutes immediately would be Allison. Because like, I can't see Klopp risking Fabinho that quickly or Firmino that quickly. Then I'll get that again. I could also be very wrong here. The thing that I could also see is what is that midfield going to be for the first game? Because you know, yeah. Henderson hasn't been back in training yet. Um, Thiago. Thiago's back, I think, for maybe three days. He's back for four days now. Yep. So, like, oh, what, what? I'm sure he missed training today, though. So, I don't yeah. know what that's about. Huh. Like, what are, are we actually going to go into no to Norwich with uh, Milner, Keita, and Elliot as our starting midfield for, for, for week one? Um, seems seems doubtful. 
Um, I mean, <laughs> even, at this point, even at this point, even if you bring a transfer in, there's absolutely no way Klopp is just going to be like, regardless of who it is, it could be yeah. Saul Negan. Klopp is not going to throw Saul in with, without being like, here, you haven't learned the system, go play. Yeah. It's just not how he operates. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, he, uh, I think the way he got around it with Shakiri was to stick him up front so he didn't have to learn the complicated midfield routines. Yeah. And someone might argue he never learned the complicated midfield <laughs> routines. But, uh, so so uh, I think what this, this moves us nicely into a topic I did want to explore because uh, I, I, I met one of our supporters club members yesterday and they had not seen the Hertha game and therefore were like, oh, we're losing to Hertha Berlin. This has got to be bad. And Manchester United and all these other teams are spending lots of money and how are we ever going to keep up? So um, I would like this segment to be like, uh, how do we kind of look at this rationally? Um, because I, I think we're in pretty good shape, um, but maybe, you know, I'm, I'm in a minority on this. So I'll, I'll start with you, Justin. Has the arrival of Varane and uh, Sancho and, and maybe goodness knows who else and the impending arrival of Grealish and Kane kind of put the, the Premier League out of our uh, hands this season? Well, I mean, let's dissect what these other teams are doing, right? Mm-hmm. I'll start with United. No. Um, hell no. The reason being the manager, right? Is it like he doesn't tactically set them up to it? Like they don't they don't have a tactical setup as to how they attack, right? They they have a tactical setup that basically says that their midfield doesn't do X. They haven't improved really what the midfield structure is going to look like. In the end, it probably looks like he's probably picking McTominay, Fred, and Bruno. Very often, he'll burn the three of them out, and they're going to keep going into the same situation. Well, he's going to keep picking Bruno as a ten. But he's get, like, Solskjaer is going to hold them back. City, I'm. This is where this is where I am with City. I, I think that both Kane and Grealish are good players doing certain things in certain systems. But if you bring Harry Kane and Jack Grealish into that side, okay, maybe you have Raheem Sterling as well. But um, look at the rest of their outside. Separate Sterling from the rest of their forwards. Maybe Mares because you can all besides. Is if you're bringing in Grealish and Kane, you're spending as much as you're going to spend for them. They're going to play a lot of minutes, right? So then, what? Look at the rest of their forwards. You've got Sterling, Mares. You figure maybe one of them goes at some point soon. Um, Foden, what's in their midfield? You know, Gundogan, De Bruyne, Rodri. What, what's what's the common lacking thing here? I'm not going to try to make play, play and get game. It's not particularly tasty, right? They're like, granted that they're not a team that typically plays on the counter because they have the ball a lot, but there's not a ton that you're afraid of at that, that point getting in behind you. So basically, like, City's way of doing this is going to have to be through ball movement. And I think with guys like Kane and Grealish, they're not guys who invite typically fast ball movement systems because they're used to having the ball at their feet so much. So I think that Guardiola is really going to have to tweak how he uses them and how they play. So which might not be instinctive because you're talking about a 25 year old to at Villa who is everything has gone through it. Talking about Kane, 28 year old at Spurs, everything goes through him, right? And the improvement in Kane's game last year saw him playing more withdrawn and not being as far far forward in the box, right? I I, I don't know how that'll work for City, but if there's a manager who knows how to figure that out, it's Guardiola. So like. I'm not going to discount this, and I still think City are probably the odds-on favorites. But I do think that the, there's another factor at play here, which is Liverpool supporters like to overrate what our opposition has while ignoring what we've got. Yeah. <laughs> we've got a lot. Of, we have a lot of, like, our first 11 is probably still better than everybody else's. Where it drops off is our, is our depth on the bench, and that's still an area that's still a concern. I think that's still something that we'd all probably like to see addressed. Mm-hmm. In particular, also, if you're losing Guinea Wijnaldum's minutes, because that's a guy who basically could just play and play and play without getting injured, which is not something that the rest of our players can do. But I, I don't think I'm as concerned about what other teams are adding at this point. I'm more, it's more I just want to see us just close those two gaps in what we have, where it's needing another forward and it's needing another midfielder. Um, I think you'd like, to, obviously, to, for us to fill those roles. 
and you'd like to see us probably bring one or two guys in from outside the club. But at the same time, you also have to hope that Curtis Jones continues to grow, that Harvey Elliott can integrate correctly, that maybe if we're not going to sell to Kimi Minamino, perhaps he actually can, act, can fulfill the functional role that he was brought in to do. So it's not like Liverpool starting from, you know, from, from zero. It's just people like shiny new toys and we're not getting those just yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I, I, I would agree with everything you said about uh, United city. I'll go to you next, Sean. The, the one thing I didn't in fact add about United is, you know, we, we talked about this before their average has been two points a game for, for, for a long time now. They're going to need some adjustment <laughs> to get from two to a win, a number that's going to win them the league. Uh, and I think one of the things I always go back to is when we had uh, Simon Brundish on the show, probably very early on, uh, he talked about the issue United have with Maguire and De Gea, where De Gea does not like to leave his line and Maguire is not that fast. So it makes it really hard, um, even with peak Varane, to play a high line. Uh, which most of the really good teams do. Um, hopefully, I haven't stolen your thunder, Sean. No, I mean, I, I'm. I, I think I'm much more confident about this year than most of our fans seem to be. Um, I, 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 I just, I, I'm feeling really good about this year. Um, I think it could, I think it could take a little while for us to get going, but. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that we can get close to the pace we were on and between 18 and, and uh, 2020. Um, yeah, I, I don't really see a reason why we can't. I mean, we, we, we do kind of lack the depth that Justin was talking about. And I really do. I mean, I expect us to bring in at least one more player. I, I hope we bring in both a forward and, and a midfielder. I, I'm pretty confident that we are going to bring in a midfielder. Um, and I think we need another forward. So I, I worry a little bit that we might not bring someone in there. Um, but like, if we do those two things, where are the holes in our team? <laughs> you know, I mean, we could, yeah, like we could use a little more depth, like who's going to play backup right back, you know, would be the next thing I would think of. But I mean, if backup right back is your biggest problem, you're doing pretty good. Um, we, I think, you know, I, I I can't think of a starting eleven in the world that's better than than what we, you know, basically already have. I mean, Bobby's dropped off a little bit, but outside of that, you got like Mane, Mo, Tiago, Fabinho, Henderson, and then the best back four and goalie in the world. So, you know, I, I do have I, I struggle with with what everybody's so freaked out about. I mean, it, you know, we still have a, a really good team and. I think we will bring in some more players. Um, you know, to Justin's point about um, United and, and and City in particular, um, and I expect Chelsea will be buying more players too. Um, I don't know who those will be. Uh, it doesn't seem like Holland's moving this summer, but I guess you never know. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think Varane's a very good center back, um, but he's. He's probably not quite as good as he was a couple of years ago. Excuse me. And um, Sancho is very, very good. Um, but, like, they don't have a manager that's going to be able to use them effectively. And like you said, I mean, the, the, the two full seasons that Salter has been in, in charge, they've averaged under 70 points a season. I mean, they had a little more last year, but basically the same, you know, two points a match kind of thing you were saying. Yeah. With City, I, I do think if they get Kane, I think Kane – you know, does potentially improve them um, a little bit in terms of having, you know, kind of a ruthless goal scorer in front of, in front of goal. I don't think Grealish improves them at all, personally. I, I, I just, I don't, I don't see how maybe he checks the box for homegrown, but I don't really see how, how is he any better than what they already have? You know, they have Gundogan, De Bruyne, Foden, Sterling, even Bernardo Silva, who we all hate, like, is Grealish any better than any of those players? I mean, I, I wouldn't take him over any of those players, personally. Um, allow, me to, allow me to pose a quick question, right? What is the better – who has the better outcome here? Manchester City getting Jack Grealish for 100 million pounds or Aston Villa getting Annie Buendia at Leon Bailey for 60 million of those pounds? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a ladder, right? It, 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 it's a ladder. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and, and I kind of think like I, I kind of wonder if if City would have been or would be better off bringing in somebody that's 
not like a Kane or a Grealish that can just sort of be squad options. You know what I mean? Like that can that can really fill in and aren't going to demand the wages and the um, minutes. Um, but I, I think it's probably a lot of it has to do with their homegrown requirement. You know, I mean, I'm guessing that's why they're spending so much money on Because they do have an issue there, I believe. Yeah. I think they do. Are, aren't they in terms of homegrown players? I think so. I think one of the players they had in their squad last year is like never going to see a minute for them. I, I can't remember the name of the, the, the poor guy, but he was just like basically sitting on the end of the bench, never going to play on yeah. that squad option. But, um, you know, but it, but again, I don't think it really improves them as a, as a team. I don't think it improves them as a squad very much. Um, and, and, you know, I don't really think Kane is better than Pete Aguero. He's probably maybe better than what they've seen from Aguero the last couple of years. But, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, you know, it, if, if, if they were signing maybe different players for different positions and if United had a different manager, it would concern me. But otherwise, it just seems like they're spending a lot of money to not really improve the yeah. teams very much. So. It would scare me if they spent that two hundred million allegedly on Holland. Oh, yeah, be. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Much more. If, um, or if, or if Chelsea gets you know Jules Conde, like that's I would yeah that that's definitely going to improve them if if they go get somebody like that to uh, stick in their defense. But um, just like detour on that. that, that guy's a central defender and he's five foot ten. Am I missing something? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, he is, but apparently he's, you know, just from everything that I've read and heard, he's supposed to be an incredible talent. And um, my guess is that he would play on the right side of their back three. Um, but yeah, everybody that I've seen, it's just, you know, said he's uh, he's going to be one of the top defenders, you know, at least that's the expectation. Um, he's, and he's, but he's still very young. I mean, I guess you don't know, but yeah. um, to me, if you plug him in there instead of, 35-year-old Aspilicueta for most games, that's going to be an improvement for them. Okay. Um, yeah. If they're playing so, about three, yeah. So, yeah. so, so Hytham, um, you know, who, who's who's scaring you out there? You, you have to share the same perspective on being less worried about some of these acquisitions than many of the people out there on Twitter. Uh, the only team that really scares me is Fulham, and they're not in the Premier League anymore, so I'm not worried. Um, uh, you know, for uh, jokes aside, I think for United to get players and, and, and um, City getting players, the one thing that a lot of the uh, knobs on Twitter forget is with all the problems, injuries uh, of last year, you know, the ones that the team went through, we still got third place. And a lot of the players that were or did not participate are actually coming back. Um, you know, whether it's the two central backs, um, Hendo was not there for, you know, uh, the last, what is it, a uh, couple of months of the season. Um, so, you know, teams can go and, and sign players. That's just the nature of the game, you know, uh, the past few years or since a couple of teams got uh, bought by um, uh, an endless uh, cash supply. Um, well, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so that's 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 just unfortunately the status quo nowadays. Um, and and uh, if we try to keep up with a couple of teams, it's just it's never going to be enough. Um, so I'm a big believer in systems. Um, you know, uh, Sean and 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 um, Justin identified you know a couple of places that we could improve on. Not that we're bad. Um, you know. I would say the least is we're, we're decent uh, at those positions, but we need reinforcements um, and, and, and and depth. So that's that's really what I look at. I'm not worried about British and, and Kane, um, you know, and even if, you know, both teams, the, the two teams that we talked about, even if we include Chelsea, if um, they get better, I think that's good for the Premier League. I look forward to playing them. And, and you know, if they beat us, good for them. But I'm going to be rooting for my team. And I think my team is capable of uh, playing them and, and, and beating them as well. So not worried. Here's what I found on the web. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Social Google research, the management. 
is yeah, running all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Google is just listening to me all the time. Sorry, guys. Um, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it is what it is. Um, we have enough. We have good players. Uh, don't forget Tiago. Don't forget um, uh, Jota. Uh, Jota. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. He did not play that much last season. Yeah. Um, Minamino is back. You know, um, and if we get. Lautaro, whatever you know, uh, Indy Kela is saying, you know, that's 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 a plus, but I'm not worried. Period. So we could definitely go down a few blind alleys, you know, discussing. Uh, uh, I, I I don't know about you, but every day I wake up to somebody who I've never heard of. Like it's it's on my feed saying, "Oh, Liverpool had just signed insert name here." Like the today's was about that Fiorentina striker whose name I can't pronounce. Well, I have much. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, it is, it's like peak silly season right now. It's, 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 it's hard. Like it's really getting hard to, to, to know like who is a real target who isn't. I mean, I, you know, I have my own opinions, but it's like, there's so many names that get thrown out there every day. It's like, you know, I did. Blahovic, Saul, you know, um, Malinkovic, Savic. There's even been one around Adama Troy <laughs> recently. It's like, yeah, you know, it, it's, you know, there, there's 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 so many things getting flying around it, and I enjoy kind of the nonsense of tracking it, even though. But I know it gets on a lot of people's nerves, um, it, and I think the reason it gets on people's nerves is because people get all worked up and angry about it. It's like, yeah, I just I just kind of enjoy reading about different players and thinking about how they might fit with the team, and ultimately, you know, I'm sure whoever we decide to go after, we've you know, Pop and Edwards have proven that. They'll only go after people that are going to be good fits. So, so, so one, um, so so let's 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 kind of close with one uh, big topic. So we we could go down the rabbit hole of like transfers, but but one of the themes that I've seen, um, and and it was very evident on some of the gutter show that the Anvil Rap did last couple of weeks. Um, that this, uh, so, so there's a philosophy I think that people are, um, that they're, they're basically in the hashtag. FSG out crowd, um, and I think we're you know, consistently we're, we're not in that group. But one of the things I saw was the FSG out crowd accusing people who were saying, "Don't worry, it's all good," as being FSG apologists. So I'd, I'd really like to get a, a, your your take on kind of where you are because I um, um, I'm quite relaxed about what we're doing, um, but th- this kind of got under my skin a little bit. The, the notion that you know. Y- y- a balanced view was being an apologist for um, owners who I think, you know, we can make a list of things that were good, but on the whole have been really, really good for Liverpool Football Club. Justin. I, I've got really very little time. You know what it is, part of it? It's really easy to just get likes and retweets by just being exceedingly negative and absolutist about something. Mm-hmm. Right? It, it, some of it's just like people need that serotonin fix because they're so bored. But I mean, look, I, I, my, my issue with FSG is that I think that, you know, while they're thinking about everything from a, you only can spend what you get, I do think that they occasionally should think about putting some of some additional investment into the club. Like, right now, I think it would be a good time to do so, because I do think a midfield signing and a forward signing would put us in a really good stead to challenge for the league, right? I think they're a bit too dogmatic on the, we run this this way and it doesn't change, and I think that they absolutely should try to fund or get the additional funds in just now, don't do this every window, just now, to just say we have a chance to steady the, the ship and continue prolonging this, this ability, this trophy, this trophy window that we have, right? Because every team has a, has, a, has a narrow, has a window within which they can win, provided that you don't have unlimited investment, right? So basically everybody decides effectively City and Chelsea, right? It, it's going to go in cycles. We're in the middle of a cycle. We can prolong that by investment. I think FSG should look at that and realize that that will drive continued value, you know, upwards, uh, upward drive in the valuation of the asset. But you can't also put in unlimited money because the reality is if you keep throwing bad money after bad, you end up looking like Real Madrid, Barcelona, Juve. Like there's a point at which there is a, oh shit, we fucked this up point where you just have, so many people that you can't move on way on a wage bill that's too high. We've seen it even a little bit of like what we've done. Why can't we move Nibakarigi? We're paying him wages that nobody else will pay him. 
Yeah. Why can't we move Ox? We're paying him wages that nobody else can pay him. That's how you get stuck with players on, like, like, you know, everybody's like, oh, get rid of the dead wood. Sometimes it's harder than there is to do. Like the wage structure that they've built, it's not the most flexible. They don't want to break it. So in order to change the team up, they have to be really kind of clever around how they do that. The other thing is people just look so much at net, tra- uh, net spend with transfer fees. It's not the transfer fees. It's the wages. Wages are what are important. You win league. You win league by paying very good players well and keeping them happy by playing them by paying them well. You don't win the league just by spending as much money as you can on transfers and then not paying the right wage package, right? So people have complaints. Some of those complaints are have probably a shred of truth to them, but when you actually just sit there and unearth the fact that it's not just oh how, what's our, our net spend in the transfer market. There's a lot more. There's a lot more layers of discussion. There's a lot more nuance that people want to avoid, because you can't get that out in under 280 in another 280 characters, and you're not going to get the serotonin fix from the 13th, you know, post in a really well nuanced thread that's going to continually get retweeted and liked. Yep. Wow. Considering you didn't have much to say on this, that was pretty profound. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I went far as dumb for a second. No. <laughs> so, Sean, uh, your take on the FSG apologist nonsense. Oh, sorry. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I think FSG have been overall really good owners. Like, I don't understand how people can discount the fact that we've won a Champions League and we won our first league in 30 years and they've you know, pumped a lot of money into the stadium, a new training ground, new youth training facility. I mean, like, you know, yeah, they don't have endless resources like City and Chelsea. I mean, and I think Justin's right. Like, a lot of this seems to be driven by, like, people who just want to, like, brag about what we're spending on Twitter. Like, I mean, it's, it's, how does it relate to how we're performing on pitch? Like, until... Until, like and last year I think it actually did I mean there are legitimate criticisms you know for FSG like we should have bought another tenor back before the end of the window last year and it really bit us um and then we sh- we probably should have bought one earlier in January um and that really angered me that FSG didn't do that but you know there was in the middle of a global pandemic and like there there are some reasons why they maybe didn't but you know I would I would agree with Justin that like the thing that frustrates me about FSG is that they're they seem to be very reluctant to like just go finalize a deal when we want to buy a player until we've made sales. I mean, I don't know exactly how that relationship works, but that seems to be part of it. When and it's like a lot of times it seems like they they should have enough confidence in Edwards and Klopp now where if they know that something can get done, like just go buy that player and have confidence that Edwards can make up that money by selling players before the end of the window. Yeah. But it just, I mean, I don't know. And that's just me reading into it. I don't even know if that's really the whole situation. But um, that that seems to be part of it. Um, I also wonder how much, I mean, I'm sure Klopp would love to have more money to spend. I mean, I'm not saying he doesn't. But Klopp is also very focused on team chemistry. And, you know, I'm not sure how, how much more of that he would necessarily want, you know. Um, so... You know, there's just a lot more to it, and I think, I think that's the Super League stuff and some of the other things FSG have done. Um, and honestly, it seems like the fact that they're American just angers people, and they, I think they would, uh, certain people would just like us to have owners like Chelsea or City that can just spend endlessly. Um, but I mean, I think overall we're doing pretty good. You know, like I said before. I think we have the best 11 in the league. We could use a little bit more depth, but we're doing pretty damn good right now. <laughs> and there's, there shouldn't be a whole lot to be angry about. You, you've both said, actually, that uh, that we need more depth. But I, the squad right now is much bigger. I mean, he's got, like, it needs trimming, basically, for, for like, a Klopp squad. He, he, he doesn't need... It needs... It, sorry, not to about it. It needs trimming. But it, it, it's... If we look at some of the players that we have kept on, like, I, I can't anymore with Dibok. Gave me two of the, gave me one of the funniest moments of catharsis in my life and gave me three, three goals that, you know, were amongst the biggest reliefs of my life. 
but the line between cult hero and guy who you can't get and between guy and guy you can't get to leave was crossed a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, I but think he's, he's, especially, yeah. he's, he's not the, the African combinations one, this this year. Like, we we need more than than four or five reliable attackers, you know. And then in midfield, um, you know, we're, we're actually doing okay in midfield. But you know, how reliable is Nabi to be healthy all all season? Um, you know, it, it's it. I would I would just feel a lot better if we had more depth and and an attack in midfield. But you're right. I mean. Um, it's not as bad as people make out. Yeah, there's currently seven midfielders, uh, like vying for three places. So th- I think there's a balance there. So I, I think I'm going to give you the, the last word on um, where, where do you stand on the um, FSG out hashtag FSG out um, and, and being seen as an apologist by those people. Yeah, I, uh, I'm okay with the whole FSG out only if the people that are um, Shouting about it, except um, Hicks and Gillette back. That's the only condition for me. Um, and, and it's 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 all these kids again. It's Twitter. I, I don't want to get into it. Um, but it's just they're shouting. Um, the one point that I want to talk about is just, you know, I think um, Sean mentioned it. Uh, we'll talk about it a little. Is is just. the stated uh, finances um, and, and, and with FSG and I'm not, you know, I, I don't know anything about their businesses, their revenues, um, losses, p ls all of that stuff. I have no idea, but just as a person seeing what all businesses, except for a few Amazon and, and, and whoever, um, you know, the big tech companies uh, or unless, you know, you have a, um, an, an oil well in your backyard um, everyone is, has had losses so I, I'm just uh, you know and, and with FSG they have you know a couple of uh, sport franchises you know Liverpool um, the, the Red Sox sorry Justin um, but it, it's just like no one knows what's going on they're not going to put their PL, you know out on the way for people to shut up you know so um, you don't know anything about what's going on just, just shut up and, 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 you know, as long as we're winning, uh, that's what you should focus on as long as we have uh, a decent team, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's annoying uh, to watch. Um, by no means, I'm, I'm going to say it, you know, uh, like I, the only one thing that I just uh, want to uh, stress again is, is just, just go back and look at, you know, our previous owners um, and, and make up your mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's probably good. owners you could probably point to, right? Um, uh, that's a- the other thing, the other thing I want to mention is that you know, lost in all this somehow seems to be the fact that we did spend 45 million on Kanate, and he looks really good. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not like we haven't bought anyone. We yeah. needed a defender, and we went and got a very good one who you know hopefully can be a very good, reliable defender for us. For we we also got Kanate for. 14 million pounds less than Arsenal paid for Ben White. Nice. Great. <laughs> That's going to show up in our, everybody's going to sit there and say, Arsenal back their manager. Like sometimes you do have to look at the wisdom of the deals that are being made and actually consider that because like that's actually relevant to trying to gauge the efficacy of a footballing operation. Yeah. Spending more money doesn't necessarily, like there's, there's a consistent way to throw bad money after bad. You know, say what you will about maybe the aggressiveness with like I think I think a common complaint that I've seen from some of the more level-headed people who are not just trying to you know get likes on Twitter is that they like who FSG buys, they just don't think you buy enough. That's basically where I am. Okay. I don't think you buy enough, yeah. but I think that when we do buy, we we make smart decisions, right? You yeah. could you could say that Takumi Minamino is you know maybe not sure for what we need. We paid seven million pounds mm-hmm. right uh, so i think the real issue is just do we buy enough players do we keep like do we do we buy enough depth that clock will actually use yeah yeah i think that's the conversation right 
I, I, I do think that you're, you're onto a couple of really key things there because, you know, in numerically we have depth and I think there are certain people that we would like to have please leave and, and, and fill some of those spots with more of the Edwards signings. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that people need to consider is we can't register any non-homegrown players at the moment. Right. Right. And it's easy to say, okay, you can buy someone, buy, buy a non-homegrown player, and then just leave one, another one of the non-homegrown players that you don't intend to use out of the squad. And you're paying money. to like, like, There are sunk costs, and then there are sunk costs. Yeah. A player who's in the squad who you're not playing enough is one form of a sunk cost, right? But it's not totally sunk. You might still get something out of them. Yeah. Paying pay a player $80,000 a week, and they're not even in the squad is as sunk as a, as a cost gets. Yeah. So we should be looking out for uh, Shakiri announcements coming up soon then. Because <laughs> I think we've determined uh, that Origi's not going can he, pl- <laughs> can he please go to Napoli instead of Lazio? Uh, <laughs> I, li- I like Shaq and I hate Lazio <laughs> because I'm not really into it. Not really into clubs with like a deep history of fascism. So yeah. like, just go. Th- I'd like, I'd like to be able to continue supporting him because if he goes to Lazio, I simply can't. I, I can see, I see us going down a couple of bad tangents here, but I did want to go back to one thing: the Red Sox being ahead of the Yankees. Does that make them more likable to you as a Mets fan? You know, it's the American League, and at this point in the season, I just simply can't care about it that, that much. Um, I've got my own issues and concerns with Mets ownership. And like, if you want to see me get started on an ownership group that I really don't like right now, <laughs> it's the Mets ownership group. And uh, that's a different podcast. So I don't think we, we need to go down that rabbit hole. But that comparison is, is, is a lovely one to end on. Because, yeah, it's like, be careful what you wish for in terms of alternative owners, right? So we want to close out this week's uh, episode uh, with uh, one thing that caught your eye this week. Um, I, I, I will go wherever you want, um, but um, hopefully it doesn't involve Twitter and, and transfer rumors, but you know, hey, whatever. Justin. Our three senior center backs bowling. It's on video. I'd recommend watching it. It's nice and lighthearted. Also, uh, I, I do love the size of. I'm used to American-sized bowling where the ball is actually kind of big. These are like you know, these look like the candle pin balls that you find. Actually, candle pin bowling also being relatively uh, big in the home of FSG, Massachusetts. But um, this ball, the bowling ball, the, a bowling ball of Joel Mossip uh, just looking tiny is one of my favorite sights you could possibly have. Is, is bowling a thing in Austria? Because I do remember staying at a hotel at one point where they had a bowling alley, which seemed really weird. But maybe it's maybe it's a thing. So. I I have never been to Austria, so I will have to defer that to someone who has more experience with Austria. Post it in the comments if you're listening. No, Sean, one thing this week. Uh, I, there was an article I, I saw from this is this is Anfield that we hired um, longtime head scout for Aberdeen. Um, to, to head up our domestic recruiting that I thought was interesting. And um, I, I don't know anything about him or about Aberdeen, but apparently the new Brexit rules basically don't allow us to, to sign players under 18. So the domestic recruitment is going to be more important. And I, just, I found it very interesting that he's who we, we went after. Um, I, did, I did a little bit of looking at it because I don't know anything about, about Aberdeen or, or about this guy, but it does turn out that I guess Aberdeen's finished in the top four in the Scottish league for uh, seven, eight years in a row now or something. So, um, you know, that, that seems like a good sign, but that's a, I, that was an interesting one that, that stuck out to me, um, you know, kind of on the, um, you know, again, on the youth development kind of focus and, um, it, you know, just more kind of seems like we, we've signed a lot of players that we, that we top rated players, last couple of years under 18 um and now you know we're kind of going after this guy who seems pretty highly thought of in the recruit in the scouting circles so uh good stuff you know, interesting. yeah hi them 
Uh, for me, it was uh, a bittersweet moment. It was um, when Sola Babajiri, um, who plays for the women's team, um, being loaned out to Brighton. Um, wow. And she, she was my favorite player on the women's team, the Liverpool women's team. Um, and, and it was kind of weird because, you know, I was following her on Twitter for a while and then... You know, I'm not on Twitter that much anymore, except for Indy Kaylor's page at this point. Uh, but uh, different subject. Um, so notice that she's not as active, you know, when it comes to Liverpool. And then, you know, a few weeks later, um, this past week, I heard the um, the loan move. Um, so, you know, not sure what, what the reasoning is behind it because she's one of their best players, but I'm, I'm guessing she just wanted um, probably um, Super League minutes or something like that because um, we're still in the second division, right. um, the women's team. Uh, but uh, at the same time, they brought back their, um, I think, uh, Furness was um, their best player, which was good to see. Um, she, she re-signed with the uh, the women's team, so it was kind of like you know a bitter sweet moment for me. So hopefully the loan means she's going there for a season in the hope that the Reds get back in the Super. Yeah, League. yeah, that's that's my hope. Yeah, she's she's very talented. I mean, it was just a joy to watch her. I don't know if you guys uh, have seen her play, okay. but um, she's got skills. Yeah, real, real yeah. great. Skills. Didn't see that announcement, but have seen her play. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, really serious note. Uh, gonna kind of end on. Um, this week, we learned that Andrew Devine was officially uh, identified as the 97th victim uh, unlawfully killed at Hillsborough. Um, uh, I think we, we were originally going to have this as a, as a topic, but I'm, I'm not sure what more there is to add uh, other than uh, it's important that, you know, kind of we remember how many lives were disrupted by that uh, event and, and, and how little um, culpability has, has ensued um, for, for those uh, responsible, especially as those who were uh, impacted were wrongly accused uh, for a long, long time. So, Andrew Devine, rest in peace. Um, Justin, great to see you again. Um, Hytham, thanks for joining us. Uh, Sean, uh, if you don't follow us already on your favorite podcast vehicle, and please do, we're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, and anywhere else out there with podcasts and you'll find this on YouTube as well. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, well, next week we'll, uh, we'll be heavily into getting prepared for the new season. <laughs>